All right, give it a few seconds. Fantastic. All right, hello and welcome everyone. And thanks for joining the Drupal in Government Roundtable this afternoon. I'm Griff, I'm the project manager at Skipper and this afternoon we'll be hearing from Ian Laslett. He's a director at EY with broad experience across technology and digital experience platforms. We're going to be hearing about how his team made auditing standards more accessible and easy to understand. And then we'll open up the floor for sort of a general discussion on the usage of Drupal in government. Before we dive into that, this session is sponsored by Skipper. Skipper is a containerized hosting platform built to host portfolios of Australian and New Zealand government Drupal websites. If you're interested in learning more, please reach out to me or many of the members of the Skipper team at Drupal South or on our socials. We'll get, we'll be in touch. Okay, that's enough from me. Over to Ian. Hey guys, uh, welcome. For those that don't know me, uh, my name's Ian Laslett. As, um, as introduced, I'm a director at EY in our digital emerging tech practice. And for a number of years, I ran uh, a digital agency called Adelphi Digital. Um, and we did a significant number of projects uh, in Drupal and in particular in government um, prior to being acquired. Over the last few years, we've been working, I guess, in the big government space with a lot of large clients, uh, particularly across the federal government space on their um, projects. Um, we use a range of platforms for doing that, including Drupal, but a whole bunch of other products and solutions in amongst that as well. Um, and today I'm gonna to be talking about auditing standards. Um, when I joined EY, I knew nothing about auditing or anything about auditing standards. And I still know nothing about auditing or auditing standards, but I do know uh, a user experience problem and a problem that can be solved um, through some research and design that um, has helped deliver for our clients something that was um, quite different, I suppose, to what they had in the past. So I'll talk you through, and these are meant to be very quick kind of 10 minute talks. So I'll give a quick 10 minute overview of the work we did, uh, and then we'll jump into a bit of a discussion about Drupal in government and happy to hear any feedback from people about how it's been used um, and what's going on across the industry. So um, a little bit of background. So the Auditing Standards Board is um, effectively the organisation that regulates auditing in the country. It doesn't sound very exciting to you and I, it probably isn't very exciting, but yet for some reason it is very exciting to auditors. Um, there's actually a, uh, a number of courses at uni obviously around auditing and um, there's a, a, a bit of a YouTube star who goes out and promotes um, auditing standards work and this video, um, she developed a video that focused on the work that we've done at the auditing standards board, which we thought was pretty cool. Um, and it's kind of used as a showcase for how to develop um, a better user experience for something that's really a pretty mundane kind of problem. So um, just to give a little bit of background on the way we approach the project, we um, worked very, very hard initially, I guess, to do a whole bunch of discovery and research. We sat down with students um, who were looking at learning auditing. We also went and talked to auditors, um, which was incredibly exciting. They are very, very interesting people. Um, and then we developed some design work, um, specified what they might look like and developed a prototype version of the site. Uh, we iterated that through further design and, and development work. Um, and following on from that afterwards, we developed a beta version of the site. And the site was in beta for around about seven or eight months, um, testing with real users um, before a launch. So it really followed the kind of digital service standard process um, that we need to follow when delivering digital projects um, these days. So a quick um, understanding of the problem for you all. Um, what previously used to happen was all these standards used to be published uh, as big PDF documents. And I'm sure it's a problem that is the same across government in all kinds of spaces. In this particular example, they took these hugely complicated legal documents and released them as PDFs. And that was the only way you could access them. You'd go and download a 100, 200 page PDF that had your auditing standard as part of it. And in that, there was lots and lots of links uh, to other parts of standards, lots of links to external documents, um, lots and lots of problems in terms of people understanding the context of what they were reading, um, lots of legal jargon and all kinds of things in there that made it really difficult, I guess, to um, unpick the documents. So what we did 
was talking to users, we understood what they were trying to do. And they were really trying to read all these documents together and it really became a digital and user experience problem to design something that would meet their needs. The other side to it was internally, there was some complexities about how the um, auditing staff wanted to publish and manage their, um, their documents, things like they wanted automatic paragraph numbering, they wanted links created that were kind of referential so that if something changed, the link would always update and things. Um, and also they had about four or five different styles of links, so you couldn't just use the standard linking module and things like that when building the site. So that meant there were lots and lots of, um, I guess, dramas around how did the UX would work. So just to quickly work through the solution, um, in here, um, we developed a portal here. And down here, you've got all your auditing standards. And when you go into one of the auditing standards, um, these are all preambles, you partic particular pick one of these, um, you get a huge amount of details about the audit. And we've kind of summarized the user experience here into a nice overview of what's going on. Um, in a particular standard, you'll find lots and lots of references. So when you click on a reference, rather than having to download the PDF document and bring it up separately, you could bring it up on the right hand side here. Um, and for every footnote, every reference and things, it continues to build up a picture on the right hand side of what's going on um, so that you can read the whole document in context of the original link that you had while you were opening, uh, had it open with you. Um, may not sound that exciting, but this is a huge revolution for all the users and the users who tested it were really happy with this because basically it meant instead of printing off thousands of pages of documents, they could just sit here online, bring up their standards, work through the various sections and the various parts of them um, to get it all working. The, um, the other things that they were really interested in were things like embedded copying functionality into the site. So every paragraph, you can copy the whole thing. So you can embed it in your other documents. You can create direct links to every single um, paragraph within the, the solution so that um, you can directly access it and send it off to someone and say, this is the paragraph I'm referring to in particular around a legal document and send them a link and know that it'll always be the correct link and will be maintained over time. Um, so the whole project, was developed, I guess, to make the user experience really, really easily. Um, even things like um, the whole standard being developed as a nice kind of sliding table of context, um, accessibility settings like being able to pick your own font sizes and things like that as well, were all included in the overall solution. Um, and you can jump between particular sections just using the, the navigation on the left-hand side. Um, all the um, standards have now been populated in this way. And um, it's really made a big difference to the user experience and the approach to how people are um, dealing with auditing standards. Um, and for someone like me who knows nothing about auditing standards, you can actually go into this site now and read a little bit about it, um, read a little bit about something that you might be interested in um, and actually get a sense of what the organisation does, what the auditing standard is about and how it all works. Um, so that was the UX problem. That was the solution that we did. Um, it's really something I think that's pretty interchangeable across government. We've had a few other agencies now come to us and say, can we do something similar with our documentation? Can we build up a nice portfolio of this for really complex legal documents and really make them work um, across um, agencies? So we're working with a few other agencies now on potentially releasing a similar type of functionality um, across there. Cool. That was about all I wanted to share because we we're only meant to talk for 10 minutes. So um, we might open it up for some discussion and um, questions at this point. Yeah, I might just flag with everyone. If you've got any questions, do you mind popping them in the live Q&A section? I think there might be somewhere else to chat, but that'll make it much easier to moderate. Um, all right, well, we've got a few to sort of just start a bit of conversation, Ian. So I think let's just start pretty high level. So what do you think of the future of Drupal in Australia and New, Ze New Zealand government looks like? You've pretty effectively used it, yeah, to deliver auditing standards, but, you know, do you think it has a place in, in those governments? I, I think it's a, it's a good starting point for a discussion, I think, and it'd be good to hear from the audience, I think, as well. In terms of um, overall, I think there's a perception with Drupal that maybe it's used for informational sites or maybe you can't build complex integrations or it's not suitable for, for certain more, more complex workflows. And I think 
um, you see that people are potentially moving off things like GovCMS and, and moving to other platforms or moving to commercial solutions, and that potentially could be um, causing, I guess, some kind of drama where, where Drupal's not really getting the, the benefit of the doubt, in a sense. Um, maybe the perception around GovCMS has been that, you know, it's a bit restrictive, um, the service times are too slow sometimes, um, it's really hard to, to build into because you can't just pick and choose whatever modules you want, you can't add them into the, the release very easily and things like that. And I think that's causing a perhaps a little bit of a slowdown in the take up of Drupal in government when you look back maybe two years ago, there was a huge interest in it and a huge push to kind of take it up. And I think that momentum's perhaps slightly slowed down at this point, but, but interested in other thoughts around that as well. <laughs> Do you think it's a, you know, a presentation and understanding maybe a, a per perception problem that Drupal has that sort of it's more seen as that CMS and then, you know, you're doing content stuff with this and you go elsewhere to do, you mentioned complex integrations. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a perception issue for sure. I mean, the things like um, I'm working with, a, say, a number of federal government clients at the moment who already run, run, say, a number of Drupal sites or run um, GovCMS sites as well. and But they've kind of box-holed it into this shape where it's just for um, kind of the, the idea that it's for informational sites or very simple sites. And they're not really considering it as a, a platform that could be used and grown out for developing, say, their complex forms or some of their more application-type processes. Um, so yeah, I think it's a it's a challenge um, there in perception, um, and it's a real shame in some ways because I think you can build. Obviously, we're all we're all sitting here on a Drupal conference, and it would be good to to kind of get uh, a bit of perspective from from other people, I guess, about what they're seeing in the industry and things as well. Yeah, certainly. Um, so, what do you think the bar the barriers are to using you know? expanding Drupal's use in government or maybe even opening it up further and open source like you mentioned uh, people of turning and going to sort of private products and offerings as alternatives what are what are the barriers to Drupal and open source that you see yeah I think one of the big barriers is the perception around security um, you know there's an issue potentially with open source where where people say uh, you know, I don't want to use open source because then I have to protect it myself, um, particularly in terms of um, government. Um, you know, people are always worried, and particularly with the, all the, the issues around cybersecurity in the last year or two, um, people are hugely concerned about security. And I think open source has got this bad rap potentially. And obviously we had um, kind of Drupal getting one and two over the last five years for those that have been been working in the industry for a while. And you've seen various hacks and, and infiltrations into Drupal. And I think that's caused potentially a perception that um, the platforms are not secure and not safe for people to use. Um, and I think, you know, um, Owen's just joined us now as well. Um, and Owen, interested in your thoughts around why you think there's this barrier to entry perhaps in, in Drupal and how you think um, Drupal and government is, is going for the future. So how many? <laughs> <laughs> um, I will just note anyone else that's in the audience, if you want to join this discussion, it is an open roundtable discussion and um, we would like to open it up. Um, please just uh, put a question into live Q&A and you can actually be brought to the stage. Um, so the question is, uh, what are the barriers to entry and how can we kind of solve those? So. I've done quite a lot of work around this just in terms of Drupal community development. Um, people might have seen talks that I've given at other Drupal conferences in recent years. Um, it's a topic of discussion that we have a lot within the Drupal Association. So I'm on the board of the Drupal Association. We're looking at it from a, a global perspective. Um, and it's this constant conundrum of Drupal is 20 years old. Um, I started using Drupal almost 15 years ago. Got a lot more gray hair than I had back then. And at that point in time, Drupal was the kind of hot new thing that um, everyone was jumping on board with. And I think like any technology, you have this kind of um, adoption curve where uh, it's the hot new thing, people kind of jump onto it. Uh, it starts getting used in a, a very broad 
way. Mm. Uh, and as it gets used on bigger and bigger projects, the consequences become a lot more serious. And so um, people need to really professionalize their um, uh, experience of using Drupal. So it's, it's definitely moved from this, um, uh, I suppose, I don't really like using the word hobbyist technology, but it was um, very much a grassroots technology back in the early to mid 2000s. And now it's a corporate technology. It's used by the biggest organizations in the world. Uh, and I think the, the biggest issue that we see is that um, it's not kind of decoupled React JS apps. Uh, it's not building mobile apps. It's not the kind of cool new technology. However, um, it is running these mission critical websites around the world uh, and they do need people with this high level of expertise. So a couple of things that we've talked about in recent years are um, trying to reach out to people that work in other technologies of the similarly serious nature uh, and educate them about uh, where Drupal can fit into their stack and how they can then kind of migrate across into the, into the Drupal world. I think the best uh, advertisement uh, on that count is that from a career perspective, you have enormous career longevity if you're working with within Drupal. I mean, I've been working in digital for more than a quarter of a century now, and more than half of that has been working with Drupal. So it's a testament to uh, the longevity that you can have as a within it. Sorry, I'm rambling on. I hope that answered no, the question. No, I think it does answer the question. And I think there's a, you know, what what I see in the industry with my clients and, and what's going on, I guess, is this, um, you know, there's, there's pockets where people are moving, um, probably in particular in the corporate world, there's a big push potentially to move to some open source solutions and things. I think for whatever reason, government always seems to be hesitant. And I think we were talking, you know, in this session, particularly about Drupal in government. And I think you look at some of the, the larger agencies in government. Um, and I still think there's a perception issue in that in that sense around um, the use of Drupal and the use of open source and particularly a, a challenge for those organisations to probably convince their internal, their CIOs and so forth that, you know, they should pick something that isn't a, you know, hasn't got a Microsoft sticker on the front of it or hasn't got one of the, the, the kind of big tech industry player stickers on it kind of thing. Because as soon as you move away from those platforms, there's this massive risk aversion in government and I think that causes a lot of the dramas and I think there's also you know to be fair there's probably a skills shortage out there as well you know in terms of really quality technical skills both in terms of building and, and developing sites but also maintaining and supporting them I think there's a real challenge there yeah. you know in terms of how you get the capacity and capability to support instead of doing you know a, as you say oh and maybe a hobbyist type solution where you've got you know, people building their own sites or their small business sites or their own informational sites. And all of a sudden you're dealing with, you know, a million visitors a day on some kind of big corporate or big government site and things that that the scale and the complexity and what you have to support and maintain requires a different set of skills than some guy kind of coding in his basement as we, you know, just building a site on his own. And I think that's a challenge for the industry as a whole is how we skill up those people um, and also make others outside the kind of Drupal community aware of what the platform is doing as well. I think we're very good in the community and a lot of us, I see a lot of people today who I've worked with and who I've met over the years at various conferences and things, but you know, how do we grow that pool of people that's interested in the solution and how to actually get, get it to a, a better state? Um, I'm guess open to thoughts on that as well from, from Griff or Owen or anyone else. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I often come back to is um, customers will buy, <laughs> what they're being sold by vendors. Uh, and I think the interesting thing that we've seen in the last couple of years, which you've obviously had experience with, is the large um, consultancy and systems integration firms moving into the open source space and starting to offer solutions in, in that regard. Um, and I think that's definitely provided validity for that approach with these larger customers. Um, and the more that that occurs, Drupal, from that perspective, um, I'd, I'd be good to hear from you, Ian, what your experience has been in terms of moving into a larger organisation like that. And yeah, it's, it's, it's funny, I guess. I guess going back for those that knew us uh, when we were at Delphi Digital, like we had, 
probably 250 odd staff and probably 50 percent of our work was drupal based or so at the time um so quite quite a decent size um and we joined ey um about two and a half years ago and in that time frame you know our business at the time which we thought was a decent scale we joined a business that has you know in terms of staff there's you know eight thousand people working in australia alone in ey and there's like 1500 of those are in our technology business kind of thing so what we thought was a decent sized business all of a sudden you're kind of part of this massive um, massive machine in a sense where you know there's big service offerings around microsoft and sap and all those other bits and pieces that make up uh, a kind of i guess a big consultancy offering and um drupal to be fair, I mean, we still do a fair amount of Drupal work, but we've also had to then diversify the skills that we had to work with some of the other platforms. Um, in in the kind of big industry world, it's still hard, I think, to go out and get a $10, $20 million deal on, on doing anything related to Drupal, whereas the deals around Microsoft and some of those things seem to, seem to flow through pretty easily because I think CIOs and because others of big organisations are quite familiar with that, that kind of scale of deal. Um, so joining EY, I think it was a real challenge and almost an eye opener to come in and say, well, you know, how do we pitch a, a team that's done a lot of this work to an organisation that really doesn't even understand, say, digital development particularly well? Um, they're so used to um, product offerings and, and kind of wrapping themselves around um, a big vendor partner or something to, to get a deal done um, when we were kind of in there almost on the ground level building solutions and sites um, that was... You know, it was part of the overall solution offering, but, you know, it wasn't, you know, it might have now it's kind of become, you know, a small chunk of what is a much, much bigger deal and things like that as well. So it's a pretty hard market in the big four, I think, even to get into that space. I know Deloitte does a fair amount of Drupal work and I know some of the team out there quite well, but I think it's a similar situation there. You know, it's, it's much harder to get um, the deals over the line in the open source space with the big clients than it is the, the commercial space would be my take on it. Yeah, I mean, I think my experience with that as well has been um, those big firms, they'll have their site core offering, they'll have their Adobe offering, um, they'll have their Microsoft offering, not so much in the CMS space anymore. Um, and there's always that tension between, okay, well, are we cannibalizing uh, work from another division within the organization by pushing a new offering? And I think my understanding of what's happened within that space is it's more been driven by the client coming to these organizations and saying, well, we've adopted Drupal. <laughs> and if you want to work with us, then you have to offer that to us. And that that's been the trigger as opposed to, um, uh, those big consultancies seeing the opportunity there and then building it around that. Um, yeah. and, and to be fair, the response is we will do what our clients ask us to do. <laughs> Yeah, and I think I'm think, thinking back to some of the bigger deals around Drupal in government over the last few years, right? And and those kind of deals are, I think you're right, client driven. So you've got clients coming in, going, oh, you know, we've already picked a platform, or we're already using GovCMS, for example, in in some of our solutions, but we want a more fully featured Drupal offering. And there are there are some departments and and some of the bigger ones as well who have said, well, therefore our our overall platform will be Drupal, and we want to push a whole bunch of things into that. But I still think it's it's certainly not the norm and it's certainly compared to, you know, there might be 95 deals that are Microsoft or SAP or some of these other technologies and in the CMS space, you're right, whether it's Sitecore or Adobe and things like that as well. Um, um, and then all of a sudden there'll be a thin sliver of it, which is open source. And I think it's disappointing as a, in some ways, as a taxpayer and as a, a member of the community that open source doesn't get more of a look in and, and some some departments and agencies just default to buying a commercial product because it's, it's seen as safe and easy for them to do that. So... I think there's a real challenge there um, to kind of get visibility with those senior executives about what the product can do and the fact that it is so broadly used in the enterprise space um, around um, and around things that aren't just informational sites but in, in complex problems and things as well. So th this is something that uh, came up in today's news around I think the Digital Transformation Agency has kind of wiped their hands of uh, government design system that's mm. been in place for the last few years. Um, are you familiar with that story? That yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's worth talking about because um, if we rewound this conversation to ten years ago, mm. um, 
the move was very much let's um, ensure that open source is considered um, as part of each project and that was mandated um, within the Department of Finance. I think it still is the case that there is a mandate there that open source must be considered. Um, there was a big push towards accessibility, um, many problems of which still exist today, a decade later. Um, and there was this push towards not so much uniformity, but reusable um, components. So whether those components are code components or design components. And I think this story that came out today, if people aren't familiar with it, um, Ian probably knows more about it than I do, but uh, there had been a common design system across government sites that um, anyone building a new site could leverage. And that had been maintained by the Digital Transformation Office. And the news as of, of today is that um, they are now no longer maintaining that. I think the official line is, we're leaving it to the community. <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, that one's an interesting one, I think, because that design, um, I don't even know, the design framework, I guess is a good word for it, is it was not, I think, as widely used or as widely accepted as it could be. I mean, there was there was a big push, particularly from, and I think it comes down to politics a lot of the time, as it always does in government, that some of the agencies were just like, well, we don't want to use that. It's not really part of our thing. They didn't like the the DTA um, pushing and mandating these things. Um, the DTA's role has also changed recently in, in the most recent MOG changes that the DTA is not kind of going to be responsible so much for um, kind of driving these things, but it's more going to be on the other side of the fence in terms of checking that people are following, say, the procurement guidelines that and those kind of things, rather than driving new solutions and, and delivering kind of, um, I guess, expertise in that sense. So the DTA's role has changed a little bit. The design standard was was one example and one casualty perhaps of the fact that, that the DTA and the DTO have not had a great experience in pushing out their um, knowledge and expertise to, to a lot of the agencies. And there was some big pushback from, from certainly some of the large agencies about what the DTA was doing and basically, you know, basically being tell the DTA to go away. You know, we know what we're doing. We're a large service delivery agency, for example. We don't want to have the DTA butting into our world. You know, we want to deliver things on our own. Um, we know what we're doing. We don't need your help, DTA. Thank you very much. And I think that design standard, as noble as it was in ideas, was kind of hamstrung from the start. And without a mandate or without a kind of a real push from probably from a ministerial level to, to say this is how you approach in digital and things like that, then it's a, a real... Um, probably a, a real loss for the for the whole of government in a sense because there's, now there's nothing in your back to agencies and departments um, kind of doing their own thing without any guidance at all, um, which is unfortunately with the political world that we live in, I think that you're going to see that continuing and unless there is a real push, um, a push to change how digital is done in government. And, and I can't see that happening in the short term, um, even with the, I don't know, for those who read the, the government's 2030 kind of digital agenda that came out earlier in the year, you see in there, there were some kind of big programs of work um, around, say, identity and around um, trade standards and a few other things, um, mapping and, and things in there. But it didn't, it was really interesting because they released this big program of work, but in it, they didn't really give it an owner. They didn't really say, you know, this minister and this agency is responsible for it all and they're accountable for making sure it all happens over the next uh, nine years. So instead, you get bits and pieces of it divided up and chunked into different agencies who are trying to deliver parts of it. And it's just become... Um, I guess another another thing in government where one agency wants to own it and doesn't do anything about developing a standard and things like that as well. So, um, but an interesting take anyway on on what's going on with government. So we're effectively back <laughs> to square one. <laughs> well, you, I feel like we have, and you're right. Like thinking back, you said you know we're going back ten years ago. We you know we were thinking about accessibility being an issue and um, pushing the use of open source, and I feel like the last year or two particularly since COVID it maybe it has gone a little bit backwards in that sense that those those topics are not resonating within government at the moment um as I was saying before the DTA has kind of lost their role a little bit in that space so who's going to pick up ownership of these things um and we see even things like GovCMS obviously being reasonably successful from the Department of Finance but also a lot of agencies now moving off it um so I guess interested in your experience Owen or Griff about you know, why you think people might be moving away, say, from GovCMS and, and dripping in that sense as well, where, where you think people are going and, and, and why that might be. 
I could probably talk to it from account management perspective. Um, you know, at previous next and with Skipper, less Skipper because I'm kind of a competitor. But um, you know, we have quite a few clients especially on the SaaS model that are required to go with or, you know, instructed to choose GovCMS as their provider. Um, and for the PaaS model, you know, as soon as your requirements get a bit more complex or let's say unique, um, we recommend that they take that path. Um, you know, there are benefits to using that platform and that solution uh, for long-term support I think is probably a good way to frame it but there are um, difficulties when you have to sort of work within that framework and that box um, but it, it does still seem to be quite popular in the in the levels of government that we're working at which is primarily federal I would see um, at least in my experience well I mean as someone that has led a whole bunch of gov CMS projects recently Chris have not you <laughs> Yes, well, being being involved in them, uh, they're, they're still popular, and they're they're still definitely still going going on. Um, but you know, I think it's probably now been a couple of years. GovCMS has been available and is an offering in the space, and now you know coming back around, do agencies choose to double down or to go with it again? Um, we do have one client that's rebuilding again on Drupal nine or. I mean, maybe not Drupal 9, but is rebuilding this uh, GovCMS SaaS site. Um, so have learned some things and have chosen to go it again, but mainly because of that instruction that they should do that. Um, and maybe not from a desire. Yeah, it, it, was the instruction within their department though? Is that something that, that you're seeing kind of push or was it kind of more of a global government push? Because I, I think the global government push, I feel, has dropped off a little bit. You know, you had finance pushing it quite hard in that first year or two, but now less so perhaps. Yeah, I, I would say it's from an internal, we have done this, this is how we build our sites. Um, we're doing it again um, <laughs> rather than everyone is doing this. This is the way Australian government sites are built. I would still say there's quite an appetite and um, Drupal, as mentioned a few times today throughout the sessions, is, is the go-to provider and is go-to CMS platform um, at various levels and uh, post-COVID or, you know, in the sec COVID second year, so to speak, um, Drupal is definitely still, there's still tenders coming out and there's still appetite, interest and uh, activity in there, um, at least from a website development standpoint, um, but probably less so we need you to work in the GovCMS space. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's still demand, right? And there's a big, there's a big Drupal 9 push, obviously, at the moment to, to kind of get people upgraded and, and running on the latest versions and things. So that's part of it, I suspect. Um, I think there's a big uh, and maybe this is just exposure from now working in kind of a big four. I mean, the bigger end of town seems to have, have taken that and done their, like, and I look at Services Australia and I look at um, places like even Desi and places like Health and things like that who have done some work and a lot of work potentially in GovCMS, but now also are looking at other platforms for other parts of their solution as well. So, um, you know, and they're not, not even considering Drupal in some cases for for what they're doing in that space so you know you you know and there's a lot of a lot of users and a lot of do dollars behind some of those places that um you know make it you know as, as a supplier in the industry you want to get some of that work but it's actually really hard then to push open source if, if it feels like the decision's already been made to potentially move away from a drupal or even move away from open source in that sense and, and go to something else as well um so yeah. i think yeah, real, a real challenge potentially in some of those bigger places to, to get that done. And people have done those sites already and now are going, well, what else can we do? We'll try something else and, and move on a little bit as well. Yeah. And what alternatives do you see frequently considered? Um, you, you know, if people are already making these decisions or it's not strictly Drupal or it's not strictly GovCMS anymore, what what is it being entertained or, you know, we're open to looking at other platforms? I think in the... It's interesting, even the branding around it has changed a little bit. So you talked about content management systems before. I think 
what I'm seeing now is the language at the big agencies is about the, the digital experience platform. So they may be looking at the Adobe's and Cycles of the world and kind of saying, well, you know, that's where the commercial world is branding themselves and, and kind of saying, this is the stuff we can do. Now, I'm not saying there's been a heap of deals in that space. There's, there's some very public ones that, that people would be aware of already. But, you know, there is, um, I think, a sentiment within some of those bigger organisations that potentially those solutions are a better fit whether they are or not is really kind of up to the individuals involved to make their own decisions based upon what they're trying to do um but certainly it's it's pushed um a lot of work potentially to some of those those vendors that they may not have been seeing in the past and things as well so um and also i guess things like even some of the i guess if you look at the magic quadrant stuff obviously those two are kind of in the top corner but you've got your your life raise and your epi server whatever it's called now in the middle as well kind of thing and those kind of platforms which weren't were getting almost no traction two or three years ago i think starting to get a little bit of traction again now in the market and and moving some things off drupal into some of those platforms has become um kind of another project as it were as well i think my experience with that um has been primarily the digital experience platforms uh, do a very good job at marketing themselves in that context uh, and they can go into a client and say well we're going to take care of all of your CRM and all of your email uh, communications and yada 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 it's a complete package um, and it's a very slick package and people know that if they sign on the dotted line there's a kind of suite of features that they're supposedly going to get. Um, obviously, the experience of deploying those platforms can often be quite different to <laughs> what the sales pitch might have been to begin with. And I think um, Acquia, obviously, we had Dries talking earlier today, but they've definitely kind of gone down that path of saying, okay, well, Drupal is one component of our Acquia digital experience platform. Uh, and we've got our personalization engine and um, uh, marketing platform and all of those types of things combined into a, a neat package. I think where we, as I'm putting my previous next hat on, have tried to steer the ship is Drupal can still fit with all of your best of breed technologies. And this is a line that we've pushed for quite a while. Um, so if you are using Marketo for your automation, if you're using Sajari for your um, enterprise search, if you're using whatever email platform, Drupal is still a really thing to be able to integrate with all of those things um, and creates a much more modular approach that clients can use. So when the new cool thing comes along, you pull that out and replace it but you've still got your core platform there and it, it means that the longevity of your platform is probably going to be a lot more robust. Um, and we've definitely seen that with clients like Service New South Wales who um, have a myriad of different platforms that Drupal's connecting with in various ways and those platforms come and go, but Drupal has stayed in there for a solid decade now. So that, that's been... Yeah, and I think that, I mean, that, that's right. I think the, the agencies like Service New South Wales have picked a particular approach, right, where they've said, well, this is part of our core platform offering, and they might do some other stuff around that, and they might have different products behind the scenes in, in terms of CRM and, and other spaces, but they've said, you know, we want the that kind of Drupal platform in the core of it. And some agencies have gone down that path. I mean, certainly that's what um, Desi were doing at the federal level for a long time, and, and some of the other agencies have been, have been saying that they're doing health amongst others, but I do think... Um, in those agencies, there's certainly a push from probably more from the business areas than the technical areas in some ways to say, well, what else is out there? What else is in the market that we can use or, or look at as well? And, and how will that work with all these other products that we're constantly being sold? You know, they, none of these things these days are kind of implemented in isolation, certainly not in the big departments, right? You're, you're integrating into whatever backend systems they might have, into CRMs, into workflow systems, into all kinds of stuff as well. Um, and the other side to it, I guess, is that you've got really weird players coming into the market kind of things like people like you know salesforce saying or oh, we can do all your web stuff now as a salesforce web thing which you know not that it's any good by the way but you know it's just something that that has been pushed um service now doing the same thing so if you're looking at people who are running big service now implementations they can say service now go in there and do this whole spiel that says oh we'll do all your web on service now as well and it's like huh 
to me, that makes no sense. Yet, yet it resonates in the market because all of a sudden people are saying, well, I've already got this big platform. Why can't I just tack my web on the front of it as well? And therefore, off you go. Um, so, how, how complicated can a website be? Exactly right. Well, how hard can it be? Completely right. And so I think it's really strange you're building a, a website into a, what effectively is a workflow management tool like a service now, yet people are doing that and, and kind of with potentially poor user experience and poor design outcomes and things because the platform's not really designed for it. Yet from a CIO point of view, it ticks a lot of boxes because there's one maintenance contract, there's one one net to strangle if things go wrong. It's all kind of in the same platform, all in the same cloud. They've already done the security certifications, everything they need to do. So all of a sudden, a lot of headaches go away from their point of view. Now, whether it's right from a content authoring and content management public process probably not but you know they that that's the kind of thing that that drupal is contending with in in some of these big organizations where they're they just sold a platform that that already is in there and say well you've got to use this and get on with that kind of thing so it does make it hard um we're coming to the end of our time and i haven't seen any q and a uh, questions come through so if anyone can uh send any burning questions or any questions for ian and owen through i can ask those but one thing i did want to ask ian was more around we've really been speaking about the high level of government at that federal and state level um you know health versus you know service use of files for example as owen mentioned but how does drupal you know drupal in government compete at the lower level where you know it's a much smaller team there's smaller budgets it's you know a few person marketing department you know running a website do you think there's still a space for that um for drupal in that market i i mean i think that that's the the current kind of niche market as it were almost for for drupal right now is that you get a lot of traction with the small to medium agencies you're right there might be a small web team or digital team or comms team who's looking after whatever the the platform is and they might be running only a, a relatively straightforward couple of sites and they think, you know, yes, we can definitely pick up open source. I think the problem there is that, you know, those agencies probably have now spent the last five years largely moving into Drupal. Like I think the number that are now looking at it completely new would be low. Like I think, you know, there, there's people that have moved and there's people that, you know, if, if there's people still on technologies that are on seven or eight years ago, and there is, um, they'll eventually potentially look at options and move across. And I can think of a few, few agencies in that bucket now who might come out you know to market in the next year or so and and finally kind of look at something something new but i think it is a niche space for the for those agencies to be in and, and good you know there's still plenty of work in for the industry in a sense in that space but what those agencies lack a little bit i guess is the public visibility of the solution overall right you know we're talking about how you can grow drupal and the community overall if you're going to a 200 person 300 person agency and putting in a new drupal site like it's nothing you know it's not going to revolutionize the world kind of thing you know it's, it's a nice piece of work potentially that you've done but it's not going to you know completely change people's minds about switching off to a, you know a big adobe solution or something into into a drupal i don't think um, and maybe that's where we're we're struggling in the the marketing space a little bit about what the platform can do okay one thing i did want to ask while we've got about a minute to go is just around uh Vic DPC primarily a few years ago moved and tried to consolidate and is consolidating a lot of their websites and Drupal sites into one large, you know, at this point it's a Drupal platform. Do you think that's the way different levels of government should go or do you think that's the future for Drupal in government? Is this consolidation approach? I think it's a... It's a nice model, and DPC in Victoria, you know, you're right, did it well. Service New South Wales are uh, looking at doing it, and Department of Customs in New South Wales looking at doing it on a holistic way as well. I think it, it takes a lot of the headaches away, I guess, for other agencies, but then it becomes, you know, if, if you want to buy into that as DPC, it becomes the same issue around, say, GovCMS, for example. Like, you build this platform out, someone's supporting and maintaining it, maybe you don't get the flexibility, maybe you don't get the the benefits, the true benefits of open source in that it's really quick and agile for you to change what you're doing and implement new modules and things like that. Um, so I think the question there is how is it implemented and, and is it really suitable for all these platform, all these other agencies and things to be involved in? But good question, Griff. Fabulous. All right, guys. Well, the last 30 seconds, so I guess, Ian, mainly thank you for you and thank you for your time and expertise and Owen for jumping on, guys. It's been great chat. Thanks, Owen. This session, there's a wrap-up session.
before the meetup social session. Uh, and one of those sessions is also the sprint briefing. The end. Fabulous. Thank you.